بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد ما دير بارز السلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so we're here for the very last session. And you know, when the day started, subhanAllah, I was thinking to myself, this is going to be a long day. Because there were so many lectures, so many things that had to be done. And I was like, how are we going to get to the end? And in the top, back of my head, I was like, you know what? Inshallah, Allah is going to make it easy. Allah is going to make it easy. Allah is going to make it easy. And subhanAllah, here we are at the last lecture. Everything got done, alhamdulillah. And Allah may, subhanahu wa ta'ala made it so easy that I don't even know where the time went. So just to recap what's happened so far, not only have you guys listened to six different lectures about six different topics and benefited from that, you've already prayed three salahs in congregation, you've already said sallallahu alayhi wasallam multiple times, and you've already implemented some of the things that you've learned by giving salams to people and donating some of your, your, your money. Now at the very least, if you weren't able to donate money, you had that you know, positive intention and will to help. Now all that has taken place in a short span of not even seven hours, subhanAllah. Now imagine if you were to spend each and every day of your life in such a way that it was dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to that manner. So the amount of time we usually spend sleeping, about seven, eight hours, we've spent that time right now worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just by sitting here and listening and having good intentions and participating whenever we could. So this is something to congratulate yourselves for. And this is something also to think about that if I can do it once, I can do it again, right? So that's what we're hoping that you can take away from it. My session and the last session for tonight is the last portion of the hadith where the Prophet wasallam, where he says, وَرَجُلٌ ذَكَرَ اللَّهَ خَالِيًا فَفَاضَتْ عَيْنَاهِ That this is an individual who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in solitude and his eyes start to flood with tears. His eyes start to flood with tears. So now when you break this portion of the hadith down, there are three things that stick out. Number one is the solitude. Number two is the flooding of the eyes. And number three is the concept of the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the three components we want to discuss. Let's start off with the concept of solitude itself. Prior to the prophethood of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he would love to isolate himself, right? He would go into the cave of Hira, isolate himself, reflect and contemplate. Now when you take this portion of the hadith to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in solitude, how is this something that you implement in a modern day context? How can you implement this? Does this mean I have to go all the way to Banff and make dhikr of Allah there and hope that I happen to cry and this is how we come from that category? No, that's not what's being implied at all. What's being implied over here is that this is done in a discreet manner where no one knows about it and no one is watching you. So something that's easily implementable or uh, e something easily that you can implement is when your kids go to sleep at night and you've gone to bed and you're laying in, in bed, when your spouse falls asleep, just sneak out of bed and go either to your living room, go to your basement. And that is a perfect time for you to be alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A perfect time for you to be alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this can be in your room, it can be in the basement, wherever you can be alone. And if you know if the masjid is going to be open, even come to the masjid. And perhaps that is the best location that you can find. Because the vast majority of stories that you find from the predecessors where they're crying their eyes out was not in a cave or in isolation in, the, in nature. It was rather in the masjid. That is where they would cry their eyes out. So that solitude doesn't have to be a specific place, it's any place that is easily accessible for you. Number two, crying and tearing. What causes an individual to cry? And what is the implied meaning of he remembered Allah in solitude, so he began to cry? The scholars mention that a person will cry for four reasons in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when you cry out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's for one of four reasons. Number one is that you committed a sin that you feel really, really bad about. So from time to time, we will slip up, we will make mistakes. And we know we shouldn't have slipped up and we shouldn't have made that mistake. And when we look back at that slip up, we feel, SubhanAllah, 
Allah has given me everything, but I still manage to commit that sin. And it causes you pain in your heart, so you begin to cry. And that is when you recognize your own shortcomings, your own deficiencies. When you speak to people that are just finding their faith again, and they realize that they haven't been praying for the last 5, 10, 15 years, usually their first salah is like that. That is what ends up happening. That they realize what terrible servants they've been of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that pain of sin, it actually gets to them. Number two, is that you realize that you've been ungrateful in thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you so many blessings. You wanted a good spouse, Allah gave it to you. You wanted a nice house, a nice car, Allah gave it to you. You wanted a nice job, Allah gave it to you. Each and every single thing that you asked for, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to you. And then as you recognize all of these blessings, you can't help but feel, what could I possibly give back to Allah? The one that owns everything, the one that sustains everyone and everything. What could I possibly give back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There's nothing that I can do. And then that is the second reason why the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will begin to tear up as he remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, when the slave of Allah has a need that needs to be fulfilled. So for example, someone that can't have a child, right? They've gone through a prolonged period of time where they've tried and tried and tried and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just hasn't blessed them with a child and it doesn't seem that there's any hope in sight. So this individual, he raises his hands and he begs and pleads with Allah, Oh Allah, you're the only one that can grant me this child. So tears start to come out of his eyes because of this emerging need. Similarly with someone that has been patient for so long, trying to retain their chastity, yet marriage has become so difficult and they're unable to get married. Someone that's been trying their best to get a job and each and every door as they go and apply seems to be close to them. This individual has a need from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but it seems that it can't be met. And he realizes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is his only recourse. So he begs and pleads with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number four is just natural pain. Some major incident happened in your life where you feel pain and that is what causes you to weep out of, the, uh, uh, you know, out of calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've seen this particularly when a couple has had an infant die. So for example, you know, an infant child is born or at a very young age the child passes away. It's a very difficult thing to deal with, subhanAllah. Or someone whose spouse passed away when they were married after being married for like 10, 15, 20 years. Your parent passes away. These are painful experiences that we go through. Now particularly the last one, the scholars mentioned this pain that you feel. You can actually use it as a means of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, people look for ways that they can cry in their salah. These individuals, in their salah, if they start to think about this terrible incident, they'll naturally start crying in their salah, or as they're making dhikr, or as they're just making dua, they'll begin to cry, because that pain is so fresh inside of their heart that they'll begin to cry. Now this is what the scholars of the past mentioned. There's another one that I would like to add on, and this is just from my own experience. One of the beautiful things that um, I witnessed was when Shaykh Ali al hudayfi you know, the Imam of Al-Masjid al-Nabwi, he was reprimanded and he was suspended from leading Salah in Al-Masjid al-Nabwi for about two years or so, or maybe even more than that, I can't remember exactly. But I remember the very first day when he came back, Salat al-Isha in Al-Masjid al-Nabwi, as he led the Salah, he couldn't even get to the first three or four lines of Fatiha. The first three or four lines of Fatiha. He was so overwhelmed by emotion. And I remember some of the students had an opportunity to visit him sometime later and they asked him, you know, Shaykh, what was going through your mind as you led that salah? And he mentioned that I was overwhelmed with gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me this immense privilege to be an imam in al-Masjid al-Nabwi. And subhanAllah, think about it. What an immense privilege it is to be an imam where Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the Imam, where Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was the Imam, where Umar radiallahu anhu was the Imam. And then added to that list, you're the Imam of that very masjid, subhanAllah. What a privilege and honor. So someone begins to cry out of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this one in particular, I believe is perhaps the most difficult of them. Because mankind in general is very ungrateful. And even when we have things to be grateful for, we start to look at the things that we don't have and we start coveting those things rather than being grateful for what we have. 
So weeping out of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those are the five possible reasons why someone would begin to cry out of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At this point, I actually want to recommend a very good book for you. It's called Weeping Out of the Fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's written by Sheikh Hussein al awaisha It's translated, translated into the English language and it's a phenomenal book that talks about how to weep out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we get to the third component which is the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rajulun dhakar Allah khali and that this individual, he remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in isolation. In order to understand dhikr, let us go back to the words of Ibn al-Qayyim. He says, Muratibu dhikr thalatha. He says the levels of dhikr are three. So the three levels of dhikr. The lowest level of dhikr is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your tongue. So when we say subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, this is the lowest form of dhikr. Then the second form of dhikr is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your heart. And this can only be done after the first form has been completed. Meaning it is not possible to reach the, seven level, the second level, level of dhikr, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by your heart, if you haven't done the first level. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't constantly on your tongue. Now what does the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart actually look like? What it looks like is that the individual strives hard in doing those things that are pleasing to Allah and he tries his utmost best to stay away from those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited. And as his iman increases, he's not just looking at halal and haram, he's also looking at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants in terms of mustahab, meaning recommended, and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes in terms of staying away from that which is makruh. And that is what the slave of Allah as he increases in iman, the second level looks like. And this is what Ibn al-Qayyim calls a dhikr al-khafi. And the first one uh, was a dhikr al-zahir. And then the last one he calls a dhikr al-haqiqi, meaning the real dhikr. Now if you've used the tongue and you've used the heart, what is left? You may think it is the dhikr of the arms and legs, but that's not the case. He says a dhikr al-haqiqi is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions you. That is the true remembrance. That is a true form of dhikr. And that is why you'll find in certain narrations, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he mentions that those that remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remembers those people in a gathering that is better than the gathering that they are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in. So we have the beautiful hadith in Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he says, never does a group of people gather together in a house from the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reciting the book of Allah and studying it amongst themselves. Except that the angels send down, or are sent down with mercy. And they encompass them with their wings. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remembers these people in the company of those who are around him. Now can you imagine that subhanAllah? What a privilege it is to have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remember you. And this is what Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah calls a dhikr al-haqiqi. That this is the real dhikr. That you become so precious, so valuable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions your name. And this can only happen after the first two levels are done. That you have to become worthy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning your name. It's not going to happen just by itself. So those are the levels of dhikr. Now let us talk about some of the virtues of dhikr. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah he has listed 100 virtues of dhikr. So I was like 100 virtues, even if I was just to list them, that's going to take like 10 minutes right there without even any explanation. So what I wanted to do was just take, you know, six of the most important ones that I found. Not even important, six that I would like to highlight because all of them are important. Six that I would like to highlight. Number one, earning forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to test you on these later. So just remember these six inshallah, okay? Earning forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Al-Ahzab, verse number 35, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He starts off the verse by saying, Inna al-Muslimina wal-Muslimat. That indeed, the believing men and the believing women. And this verse, it ends off with those that remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much from the believing men and believing women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for them much forgiveness and a great reward. The Prophet himself commented on this verse. 
by explaining what does it mean to do dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those that remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala greatly, what does that mean? He says that it is the individual that wakes up in the middle of the night and wakes up his spouse and they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what it means to do much dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To do dhikr in the middle of the night and waking up your family to do so. Then that is an example of doing much dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for, for this individual, not only will he have a great reward, but he will have much forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentions that whoever says subhanallah 100 times in a day, subhanallah 100 times in one day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will write for him 1,000 good deeds and will erase for him 1,000 bad deeds. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, whoever says subhanallah wa bihamdihi 100 times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive his sins even if they were as much as the foam on the sea. Even though if they were as much, foam, uh, as much as the foam on the sea. Number two, they are the best of deeds. Abu Dharr radiallahu anhu, he narrates from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, shall I not inform you of the deed that will elevate your ranks the most? The deed that is most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The deed that is better than going out in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They said, of course, Ya Rasulullah. He said, the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That it is the best of deeds. Number three, it is a sign of intelligence. What does that mean exactly? How is dhikr a sign of intelligence? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, the sun does not rise on a single day except that all of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes tasbih of him. Except that all of the creation of Allah makes tasbih of him. Except for two. The shayateen and the aghbiya of Bani Adam. Meaning the foolish and, and stupid people from the children of Adam. Those are the only two categories that don't make the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the shayateen and the unintelligent people. Number four. It is a means of your dua being answered. It is a means of your dua being answered. The Prophet wasallam he says, there are three categories of people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer their dua. Those that remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much, those that are oppressed, and the just ruler, and the just ruler. So these are three people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not reject their duas, their duas are answered. Those that remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much, those that are being oppressed, and the just ruler. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer their duas. That was one, two, three, four, five. Yes, number five. The training, attaining of tranquility and mercy. Now one of the things that's mentioned about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that whenever you looked at his beautiful face, you would naturally feel serene and tranquil. That he was constantly smiling, constantly happy. And just looking at him, you felt the same emotions that he was portraying. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, sorry, not Ibn al-Qayyim, one of the imams that commented on the shamail of Imam at tirmidhi I can't remember his name right now. He says that one of the reasons behind this was that the Prophet wasallam was constantly engaged in dhikr. That Aisha radiallahu anha, she narrates, the Prophet wasallam used to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of his states. In fact, the only time when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, would not mention the name of Allah or do the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was when he was in the bathroom. And that is why he وسلم, taught us to say that when you come out of the bathroom, you say ghufranak. That, oh Allah, I seek forgiveness from you. Going to the bathroom is not a sin, so what are you seeking forgiveness for? You're seeking forgiveness for the fact that you weren't able to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time. And that is the only time we have that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wouldn't remember Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So it is a source of tranquility as he saw from the hadith in Sahih Muslim that the angels come down and they spread tranquility in the gatherings of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And you can look at it right over here SubhanAllah that we've spent a whole day together remembering Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. When was the last time you felt this serenity, this tranquility, this you know, rush in your iman of wanting to do good? It only happens to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And number six, and this is perhaps, you know, I don't want to say my favorite one, but the one that I'm most intrigued by. And that is, trees are planted for you in Jannah when you make the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the beautiful hadith narrated by Imam al-Tirmidhi, Ibrahim alayhi salam gave salams to the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa went up for the Mi'raj, Ibrahim alayhi salam told the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to, to have their salams conveyed to them. And he gave a piece of advice. He says, let your Ummah know that if they want their trees planted in paradise, then let them frequent the saying of Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, and La ilaha illallah. This is mentioned in a Tirmidhi and also mentioned in Sunan Ibn Majah, authentic narrations. Now what is specific about having trees planted? For those of you that attended the, the session we had yesterday on how to attain, um, you know, on how to understand the inner dimensions of Salah, we talked about how Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he talks about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given each and every one of us a plot of land. And it is up to us to figure out what we want to do with it. So when you remember Allah, that plot of land is taken care of. When you forget of Allah, it's as if you're lighting that plot of land on fire. Here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this narration tells us something very similar. That each and every one of us, inshaAllah, we will have plots of land in paradise. They're empty spaces of land on which you will have your houses built. Now in these plots of land, it is up to you to decide what gets planted there. Now if you have a plot of land, you don't just want an empty plot of land that has nothing there, right? You want all sorts of trees, all sorts of bushes, all sorts of different things on your plot of land. And here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa tells us how to do that. That each time you say subhanallah, each time you say alhamdulillah, each time you say Allahu Akbar, each time you say la ilaha illallah, a tree is planted for you in paradise. Now Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, when he comments on this, and this is the, the beautiful thing, he says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give anyone a plot of land in paradise except that it will only be given to him. What does that mean exactly? Meaning that once you own a plot of land in paradise, once you have trees and houses and all of these things in paradise, sooner or later, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, you will get there. That inshallah, you will not be of those people that died in a state where you're destined for the hellfire forever. Allah would not allow that to happen while you own property in paradise. Now subhanAllah, think about that. Basically, in a long process, what is being said, that if you make the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is how you ensure that you die upon Islam. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqullaha haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon That all you who believe have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, taqwa that He is truly deserving, and do not die except in the state of Islam. How do we understand that? Do not die except in the state of Islam by making the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regularly so that you own these plots of land in paradise that are restricted for you and you alone. Now these are just six of the virtues of dhikr. Let's recap them. What are the six that I've mentioned? Let's go with the easiest one. Let's eliminate that right away. What's the easiest one? Trees in, come on guys, <laughs> trees in paradise. Okay, that's number one. We have number two, forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What else do we have? Raise your hands guys. Sorry? It is a sign of intelligence. Number three, dhikr, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remember you. Is that what you're talking about? Okay, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about what are the virtues of dhikr. We, I talked about six things. Three of them have been mentioned. What are the other three? Go ahead. Attaining tranquility. Attaining tranquility and serenity. That's four. Yep. Best of the deeds. It is the best of deeds. That's five. A means of dua being answered. A means of dua being answered. Fantastic. I really thought no one would get that. Jazakumullah khairan. So those are the six virtues of dua. And like I said, there's a hundred of them that Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah mentioned. And we're not going to go through all of them. But perhaps at a later halaqa, we can go through his list. Let's talk about timings of dhikr. Restricted versus unrestricted dhikr. So dhikr in general can be made in any time, in any state. As I mentioned, the Prophet used to make dhikr of Allah at all times, except when he was in the bathroom, right? So this teaches us a person is traveling, he is resident, he is sick, he is healthy, poor, rich, working, not working. You should be making the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is general, unrestricted dhikr that you can make at any times. 
So just by saying, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. These are the five, you know, repeated adhkar that are mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah. Those are unrestricted dhikr that a person should say at any time. However, there are certain times that the Prophet Wasallam gave specific virtues to them. And I want to share those specific times with you. Number one, from after praying Fajr till sunrise and from after Asr till Maghrib. There's a specific virtue at this time. That the Prophet Wasallam he says, the most beloved of gatherings to me are those from after Fajr till the sun rises and those from after Asr till Maghrib. And the one who is from these will get the reward of freeing four slaves. So not one, not two, not three, but four slaves. You've emancipated four slaves just by making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from this time. So an individual sits in his place. You don't have to sit in your place necessarily, but he stays in a, in a state of worship, in a state of dhikr from after he prays Fajr till the sun rises and from after Asr till the sun sets. And then he continues remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him the reward of freeing four slaves. Number two, making dhikr after salah, making dhikr after salah. This is the famous hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where the poor companions came complaining to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They said, "Ya Rasulullah, the rich companions have run away with all of the rewards. They pray just like we pray. They fast just like we fast. They give in sadaqah that which we cannot give. Teach us something to make us equal to them." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi taught them to say Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, and Allahu Akbar 33 times after each salah, and in one narration 34 times Allahu Akbar in particular. And he says, no one will do this except that you will be the best on the Day of Judgment, except the one who did this and more than that. So here the Prophet sallallahu alaihi is teaching us that after every salah, you should make these adhkar, and you will be from the best of creation to show up on the Day of Judgment. Number three, in the last third of the night. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, the closest Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala comes to his creation is in the last third of the night. So whoever is able to wake up in the last third of his night and remember Allah, then let him do so. Whoever is able to wake up in the last third of the night and remember Allah, then let him do so. Because that is when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is closest to his creation. And then number four, is at the time of death. At the time of death. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that the most beloved of deeds to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the man who dies and his lips are moist with the remembrance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The man that dies and his lips are moist with the remembrance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. In an explained version of this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that whoever says La ilaha illallah as his last words shall be entered into paradise. So we pray that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala makes us from this category. Amen. Allahumma Amin. So those are four times outside of unrestricted dhikr that is encouraged to do so. From Asr until Maghrib after your Salah and then from Fajr till sunrise after the Salah. And then in the last third of the night after your Salah and then, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, we, we pray Allah grants us tawfiq as the last words before you pass away. Now let me conclude with action points. How do we get into the habit of being of those individuals that make frequent dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Number one is by setting up reminders for yourself. One of the things I, I really, really loved about living in Saudi Arabia was that when we used to travel from Mecca to Medina or from Jeddah to Medina, on the highway, you would always see these beautiful signs say, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or say, subhanallah, or say, Allahu Akbar, or say, la ilaha illallah. And this is just something that, you know, as you're driving, you get reminded to make the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I thought to myself, how do you implement this on a daily routine? And I came up with the idea that one of the beautiful things that we have in our times is the usage of technology, that you can set up random alarms throughout the day just set up a random alarm, say, hey, at that time, make the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you get an alarm on your phone, make the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time. Spend 5-10 minutes, and inshallah, you're from those people that will randomly and regularly remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, set up goals for dhikr amongst yourselves. And I learned this from the story 
of the Khalifa uh, Abdul Malik that he had three young children. And you can imagine that these three young children were like shayateen in human form. Like big <laughs> troublemakers, subhanAllah. So as he's traveling with them in the caravan, they're just busy like causing chaos. So he came up with the idea. He says, do you guys see that tree over there? There's no tree over there. You don't have to look back. <laughs> he's like, do you see that tree over there? And they're like, yes. He's like, till we get to that tree, say subhanAllah. And see who can say subhanAllah the most. Then he would get to another thing. He's like, do you see that well over there? He's like, who can say Alhamdulillah the most till we get over there? So I thought to myself, how do we take a story like that and implement it in our daily lives? That make targets for yourself. That you know, on this day, I want to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 100 times. So that's your goal. Throughout the day, you have to say Astaghfirullah 100 times. The Prophet ﷺ himself, you know, 70 to 100 times, used to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So set up those targets, set up your goals for yourself. That throughout the day, this is the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I will do. Number three, righteous companionship. And this comes from the story of Musa alayhi salam. Did you know there was that famous dua that a lot of us know, where he um, made the dua, Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. That, oh Allah, expand my chest, make easy for me my affairs, so that they may understand what I'm saying. And these same set of verses, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make Harun his companion in giving dawah to Fir'aun. Now, he actually talks about why people should become friends. He explains to us why people should develop companionship and what is the characteristic that you should be looking for. He goes on to say, So that we may glorify you much and we may remember you much. So what we learn from this is that when you have righteous companionship, you'll naturally pick up to say good words. Look at your own kids. Look at our own kids in general. When do they learn how to swear? When do they learn how to say bad words? They go to school, they heard one of their classmates say a bad word, and that's how they pick up bad words. Now is the opposite not true as well? Imagine they're in a gathering where they're constantly learning, you know, the dhikr of Allah, subhanAllah, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. So he comes home one day, and a dish breaks, rather than saying a swear word, he's like, SubhanAllah, a dish broke. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? But that's the effect of companionship. So that companionship can teach you bad words, or it can teach you good words. And this is what we learn from the story of Musa and Harun. So surrounding yourselves with those people that will remind you of the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let us recap those last two sections. So what are the four times that we should try to make specific dhikr? They are after Fajr till sunrise, after Asr till Maghrib. And the last third of the night after your Salahs and Bidhillahi Ta'ala before we pass away. What are three ways that we can increase the dhikr in our own lives? Set up reminders for ourselves, set daily goals for ourselves, and surround ourselves with people that frequent in the dhikr of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala already. So I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us of this last category where we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in solitude and we're able to shed a tear for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that our faces may be protected from the hellfire. Allahumma ameen. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam. Wa baraka ala nabiyyana Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.